Turn to your neighbor and say, he is more than enough. Oh, come on, church. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's more than enough. Hey, man, I've been at a youth camp so far this week. I need some adults to kind of speak back to me. The cool thing about this youth camp, how many people have been to Falls Creek before just down the road? It's a Baptist camp, and I was walking around uh, praying in the spirit this morning. Can I get an amen? I was on my run, and I was thinking, God, there is a lot of Baptists here. And I was just watching people doing their thing, and I said, Father, you know, as we come together as kingdom-minded people, it doesn't matter whether or not you're Baptist, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Wesleyan. What matters is that you're a kingdom-minded person. And at the end of the day, he's not coming back for a certain church. He's coming back for the church unblemished. And so I greet you tonight. I am Pastor Dave Romero. I live in Manhattan, Kansas, home of the Wildcats, who we do play the OU and they usually beat us. But uh, that town turns into purple. I've never seen such fanatic, you know, fans in my life till I moved there. But this last December, my bride's not with me. We celebrated 30 years of marriage. Yeah, man, she put up with me for that long. Can I get an amen, men? And so we also have two grown kids. My son, Davey, lives in Fort Smith, Arkansas. He's 30 years old, and my daughter is 27, who just got married a couple years ago. But the highlight of my life is my three amazing granddaughters. Let me see your grandparents out here. My wife always says that our grandkids are the reward for not killing our own. I mean, there is no doubt about it. If you're raising kids today, God bless you. I like when they come to me, and I'll have to tell you a story about my youngest, who is a mess. It's always the youngest. See, I'm the baby of six, so I relate with her. And her name is Evie, and they're all afraid of her, and she's just a little thing. And she comes to my house, and mom and Nana and everybody's there, and she wants a chocolate lollipop. And, they, and, and mom says, no, you can't have this, like probably 8 o'clock at night. Nana says, she went to Nana, and Nana says, no. And so, you know, I wasn't thinking nothing. I'm just sitting in my chair, minding my own business. And then both of my wife and my daughter-in-law decide to go upstairs. And little Evie comes and walks in front of my chair and gives me that look like, Poppy, you need to do me a favor. And in this moment, I'll never forget, as her eyes looked at me, And there's a moral to this story. She looked at me, and I said, and I kind of looked upstairs, didn't see anybody, and I said, come on. Opened up that lollipop, and she began to lick on that lollipop. Here comes mom and Nana down. And, man, you know, guys, man, you know, they they have a look. Well, when you get the double look by the daughter-in-law and the wife, but let me tell you what, in that moment, I realized something to her, though it was just a lollipop, Poppy was more than enough to provide for her. And there's a moral to this story for me. In a sermon, Juan Carlos Ortiz spoke of a conversation with a circus trapeze artist, and this this performer admitted the net underneath was there to keep them from breaking their necks, but added this. The net also keeps us from falling. Imagine if there was no net. We'd be so nervous that we would be more likely to miss and fall. If there wasn't a net, we would not dare to do some of the things we do. But because there is a net, we dare to make turns. And once I made three turns, thanks to the net. Ortiz makes his observation about this small little story. We have security in God. When we are sure in his arms, we dare to attempt big things for God. When was the last time you attempted something crazy for the kingdom? We dare to be holy. We don't talk about holiness much in churches nowadays because we want to offend people. Well, if you're here tonight, I can offend you because I'm not coming back soon. We dare to be obedient. Oh, my goodness. A little obedience goes a long ways. You know, when you're obedient, you get blessed. We dare because we know the eternal arms of God will hold us if we fall. Just like with that Trasby's artist, maybe you're wondering what will happen if you step out further on faith 
to do something radical for God. I remember being at camp this week watching these young kids do all kinds of different things on these, these courses they're doing. And, you know, as you get older, I mean, I'm not real old, but as you get older, I mean, Dave, you're going to be there. You're, get, you're a year away from me. But when you get older, you realize that going on roller coasters anymore just does not really appease to you. I know for me, I'm like, no, that's happening. But these kids are doing things that when you're younger, you're not thinking about it. How many guys rode their bikes and built ramps in front of your house? Yeah, you do care because you know you're going to land on that bar a few times. But you care. You didn't think about it. As you get older, you begin to kind of slow down. It's kind of that way in our Christian walk. We want to be safe. But let me tell you something. As a Christ follower, we were never called to be safe. We were never called to be safe. The church has gone safe when we're supposed to be radical, when we're supposed to be daring to do things, when even if we're going to fall because we know that our God will deliver us. I can tell you with full assurance, there is no doubt that God will always be there to catch you no matter what. God made us a promise never to abandon us. Deuteronomy 31.6 says this, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord, your God, goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He's not only gone with you, he's gone before you. And he's asking, will you walk out on these steps? This evening, over the next few moments, I want to unpack a message that I have called more than enough. We're going to be unpacking a prayer that King David prayed and sang when he was one of, the, when one of the most difficult times of his life. Now, maybe even in a crowd this size, you are facing difficulty. Maybe it's in your health. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's just in you. You're struggling to try to make sense of a battle that you're in. And here in a few moments, when we read this prayer, it's not just something we read. Listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, when you open up the word of God, it's not just a book. It is the book of life. It's the book that will bring you through the hardest times when everyone else abandons you. Ever been abandoned by somebody? Ever had anybody talk behind your back? Anybody try to run you down? Well, David is facing a great enemy. In this chapter, we find him in a battle for his life from this enemy. This prayer we're about to read and unpack, we find David on, on the run for his life, and he's out in the middle of a wilderness. There was a rebellion going on. David had left Jerusalem, and in Psalm 3, David was in mourning because of what was taking place. But God had given David peace. You see, David, we knew, was a man after God's own heart. And in this moment, David's battling one of the hardest things for David to swallow. Listen, church, though, listen, though this enemy, this person was coming after him, the hardest part of that, it was his own son, Absalom. Let me tell you what, some of the people who hurt you the most are the ones closest to you. But as you will see that David began to rely on something greater than himself. He knew, he knew that he knew that he knew that God was more than enough. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is more than enough. Oh, you guys need to wake up on this Wednesday. I'm telling you, I came here tonight to give you a message, not to preach you a message, but to deliver you life through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what I intend to do. David is not only running from his son, he also finds himself at a place that provides no physical protection. He is out in the open, nothing to hide him. As far as numbers goes, man, things are not in David's favor at all. Things are simply not looking good for him. Many of you here this evening may be looking at your circumstances, the storm you're in, and then the natural things don't look good. Good. I have been through some very tough times in my life when things didn't look good. And my natural propensity was to run away and to try to hide. But let me tell you something. When you are filled with God's spirit, filled with God's power, you don't have to run and hide. You can stand and know that God is more than enough. 
Remember this truth. The battle is not yours, but God. Somebody needs to hear that tonight. The battle's not yours, but God. So what did David do? He prayed. So now let's read this prayer, which is also a song, like I said, and we'll unpack very quickly four points. So if you have your Bible with you tonight, open up your Bibles or your phones or whatever. Remember back in the day, everybody just carried a Bible. Now it's all on your phone. And, you know, I mean, I'm cool with that because I've got that too. And as you become a grandparent, you've got to look official with your readers on. So go to Psalm, and we're going to go to Psalm 4, and we're going to read this prayer Listen to David crying out to God. Maybe this is you tonight. Answer me when I call to you. Oh God, who declares me innocent, free me from my troubles. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long? Will you people ruin my reputation? How long will you make groundless accusations? How long will you continue your lies? I, th- these first two verses woke me up as I was preparing for this message. As David cries out to the Father, he's asking him to free him from his troubles. But here's the second verse where it says, How long will you people ruin my reputation? Anybody ever ruin your reputation or try to? Speak bad about you. I said it earlier, behind your back, talk things. Here's what I know. If somebody's talking behind your back, here's some truth for you. They're behind you for a reason. They're behind you for a reason. Chapter number three. You can be sure of this. The Lord set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will answer when I call to him. Let me say that again. The Lord will answer when I call to him. Here's the problem. We want him to answer in our time. The Lord will answer when I call to him. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Think about it overnight and remain silent. This is so important when someone's coming against you, when you're in a battle, when you're struggling because someone's talking about you, you need to take the high road and let God fight the battle. Because when you take the high road, when you take it, you will always win. Always. I promise you. So don't let anger grow in you because when you let anger grow in you, anger turns into bitterness. Bitterness turns into indifference. And when you get to that point of indifference, you don't care anymore. And you begin to run away from the things of God and you allow those that spirit. Remember, we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against spirits. And in the name of Jesus, we can conquer them by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. He is more than enough. Offer sacrifices in the right spirit and trust the Lord. Many people say, who will show us better times? Let your face smile on us, Lord. You have given me greater joy than those who have abundant harvest of grain and new wine. And I love this last verse. In peace, I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, will keep me safe. Let's pray over God's word tonight. Father, we thank you so much for the power of of your word. God, let every word that comes out of my mouth be directed by you. May our hearts be open, our ears listening to what your spirit wants to say tonight as we unpack just for a few moments what you're trying to speak to us so we'll walk out of here transformed. It's in the power and the name of Jesus. Amen. You see, this prayer is showing how David is in distress, in turmoil. But it also shows how much confidence that David has in God to rescue him. David knew. And when you look up the word knew in the Greek, it's the same one where he said, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. He had this knowing that even in the middle of his turmoil, somebody tonight, you may know someone, maybe you're in that turmoil, you're in that battle. I want you to know that God is listening to you and he will deliver you. We all deal with this turmoil and difficulties, and most likely you will come against some trials. How many, when you got saved, you were just hoping you can hit the, hit the easy button and everything would be okay? Come on, let's get real. I did. I remember when I got saved because you first feel it, man. You're like, oh, I'm free. And then all of a sudden, those friends that you used to have 
begin to come against you as the enemy would come against you by using people to remind you of your past. And you begin to have this turmoil and you begin to see, wait, I thought Christianity was easy. Come on, guys. Let me, let me read you a scripture that comes completely against that. 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13 says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Anybody watch Stranger Things? I love that thing because I, I was like right in the 80s, man. They wear the same clothes I wore and all that good. Some of that stuff's coming back. I saw a fanny pack the other day. I said, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I'm like, what are you talking about wearing a fanny pack? Are you kidding me? Wow, man. I couldn't believe it. Instead, this is, this is the key. This is the unlocking of the, the stuff that God wants to do in our life. Listen, instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering. Yes, Lord? Okay. So that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to the world. I could preach all night on this one passage of scripture. I want to pick a couple things out here. First of all, how many, when you're going through something tough, you feel joyful? Let me see your hands. Come on, be real. How many are just so glad you're like, oh, I'm so glad I'm going through this? But see, it's not so much happiness. It's about knowing, and gladness comes from the word joy. And when you have a real joy, you can stand in the middle of a storm and a trial knowing that God will rescue you. David knew this. He had a confidence that his God would rescue him. And I'm here to tell you tonight that God wants to rescue you, and here's what he wants to rescue you from the most, yourself. Because this has happened to me time and time again. I've been a lead pastor now for about six years. I was a worship guy for 31 years. And, yeah, I'm, I'm old. But, I, you know, six years as a lead guy. I remember you used to telling, as a worship guy, I would be working for all these pastors. And I said this to God, I will never do that. And God played a joke on me. He said, yes, you will. But as trials have come, I begin to understand that God has set in us something that we can stand upon, a promise. God is always at work, keeping us safe from the storms that we must go through. But one thing I know, as you pray in faith like David did, are you willing to launch out into the deep even if you don't know where you're going? I'm telling you, there's something really cool that when you're in the middle of something hard, you keep walking forward. I love the feeling of being like that scary, excited, not knowing, because you know at that moment it will not be you that will get you there. It will only be the Father. Sometimes we must launch out into those crazy, rocky waters in order to understand the protection and provision of God even in the middle of the greatest storms. That's called faith, my friends. Faith. When's the last time you exercised your faith to the point even in the middle of a storm, you said, I'm going to keep walking. We always talk about Peter sinking, but let me tell you what, you didn't get out of the boat. Those other disciples sat in that boat, and they were making him feel funny, but he got out of the boat. The dude walked with Jesus. I would have loved to walk on water. He did it. He stepped out. He knew that he was more than enough, that God, that Jesus was more than enough. But one thing I know, as you launch out, the enemy comes even stronger. Because he knows it's kingdom work. Sometimes we must launch out into those crazy, rocky waters in order to understand the protection and provision of God. Right now, so you'll just know, just two weeks ago, after six years, I just resigned from my church plant. And on this coming Sunday, we're having a big celebration as I keep moving forward. It's my last day. And people say, why would you do that? Because God's calling me to do something crazy. And people say, well, it wasn't launching a church crazy. Oh, yeah, don't do it unless God calls you. That's all i got to tell you. It's one thing to go to an established church. When you launch a church, another whole thing. But I remember God speaking to me on my porch saying, I'm calling you to do this, and I'm not going to release that yet just in case somebody's recording or something nobody else needs to know. But I'm telling you, the next step that I'm going is going to take radical faith. Daniel 6.22 I love this verse because when the enemy's coming after you, look what happens 
my God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. Let me tell you, if the enemy is coming at you and you are standing in the promise of God, he will shut the mouth. He will take that enemy and he'll destroy it. There's some powerful truths out of our main passage of Scripture tonight that I want to quickly un- unpack. So if you're taking nights tonight, so what, do we, what can we learn from David's plight? What can we learn from what David's going through? Number one, when you're in a battle, when you're in a struggle, in a storm, you need to go to your prayer closet. Because here's what happens. You see, David was over his head. He didn't know what to do. It was just, it just wasn't the rebellion, but again, it was his son coming after him to destroy him. David knew that God would deliver him, but all of a sudden, David knew that the only thing he knew to do is to cry out to God. And I want to tell you tonight, many of you, instead of going to your prayer closet immediately when you're in trouble, you go to the phone. And you call. Now, there's nothing wrong with gaining wisdom from those who have walked ahead of you. But if you're not first going to God... I'm saying if you're not first going to God and you're relying just on the wisdom of man or woman or at this place, maybe even child, because sometimes children talk right to us in a way that's so real, like, man, those, that, that doesn't look good on you. And kids will just tell you straight out. But let me tell you something. If you're not going to God first, what's going to happen is the enemy's going to use all this different wisdom at times and will bring you confusion. But when you go to God first... What does it say in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then he'll fill you with that wisdom. He'll fill you with the answer for your problems, for your trial. David defeated Goliath by faith, knowing God would help him. When he felt Saul's breath upon his neck, he knew that God would deliver him. And the truth is that as you go into your prayer closet, whatever that may look like for you, God will deliver you without fail. Every single time. Jeremiah says it this way in Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me. and I will answer you. And tell you. Listen, listen to this, man. Great and unsearchable things you do not know. Man, if you hear anything tonight... Call to me. He's, he is beckoning you to call to him. I'm wondering on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, you leave here, do you ever really call out to God in a sincere, passionate way, or you just wait to come to church? Let me tell you, church is not going to save you. Church is not going to necessarily get you out of a tight spot. Though it may encourage you and sharpen you, it's when you call to the Father. When you call the Father in your car, when you're, when you're crying at home and you're in a lonely place and you're isolated. David's in the wilderness, isolated, and he says, call to me. And Jeremiah says, call to me and I will answer. And David called to the Father in Psalms and said, oh God, please deliver me from his heart. And I love that he will show us great and unsearchable things. I want to know those. I heard a pastor once say, we can do something more when we pray, but we can do nothing more until we pray. Let me say it again. We can do something more when we pray, but we can do nothing more until we pray. Prayer is the key to unlocking the door to the power of God being unleashed into our circumstances. Absalom had his own interest at heart, and David saw that. David knew that the battle wasn't physical, but it was a spiritual battle. Prayer is essential to be prepared for those spiritual battles that we'll face in our lives. David had seen this happen before, and God showed him the enemy's plans. This is what, I love this part. When you're in prayer, remember God said he'll show you the unsearchable. He'll show you those things. Listen to what happens in 2 Samuel 5, through 24. This is so cool. But after a while, the Philistines returned again and spread out across the valley of Rephaim. And again, David asked the Lord what to do. He's again asking God what to do. Here's what God says. Do not attack them straight on, the Lord replied. He's unfolding a plan here. 
Instead, circle around behind and attack them near the poplar trees. When you hear a sound like marching feet in the tops of the poplar trees, be on the alert. That will be the signal. This is the key. Oh, come on. That the Lord is moving ahead of you to strike down the Philistine army. Man, when you are praying to God and you're listening for his plan, the unsearchable things, he will show you the plan of the enemy. You'll come behind it and he will sound the the horn. And the next thing you know, that enemy will be struck down in the name of Jesus. He'll be gone. God is always one step ahead of your greatest fear and your moment of distress. How many are glad tonight that God's always one step ahead? ahead some of you are worried how many worry warts do I have here tonight let me see here and be real how many worry about worry yeah how many are dealing with anxiety stress those things that keep us in that battle in our minds God wants to reveal to you tonight the unsearchable things so that you can defeat that in your life. But it all starts with prayer. That brings me to my second point. David had confident hope. He had confident hope. When you pray in faith in God, God builds in you a confident hope that only God can give you. The issue is, many times in the middle of our chaos... Our battles, when the enemy is coming after us to destroy us, we try to put our confidence in our own abilities to overcome the battle but end up failing. Let me tell you, don't put your confidence in what you think you can do because you will fail. I've done it many, many times. I'll, I'll give you my wife's phone number. She'll tell you. When you put your hope in what you think you can do, your talents, and listen, you can only put your hope in God. He's the one that will pull you through. You have confident hope in God. He will fill you with his Holy Spirit. It's one thing I'm noticing as I travel the country at times and I go speak or I go sing. Churches today, and it's not, listen, it's not about being a Pentecostal church or any of that, but the Holy Spirit is not moving like it's supposed to because we programmed him right out. And to be honest with you, that began to happen at my church. And I'll never forget sitting and God saying, I didn't call you to do that. I called you to follow my spirit. Because it's not in your gifting of speaking or singing or playing or anything you can do to move anybody. It's the Holy Spirit that changes the heart of a person. When we put our confidence in God, when we we get on our knees in the middle of our overcoming, overwhelming circumstance that you might find yourself in, the God that I know will deliver you. I love Romans 15, 3. I'm giving you a lot of scripture tonight to go home and hopefully you'll go back over. It says this, I pray that that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust him, trust in him. Then, You will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Man, what a great verse. When you're filled with God's confident hope for your future, that hope fills you with a great joy and a joy that brings a peace. Let this hope remind you tonight, my friends, that God is more than enough. You don't have to have anything else in life. You don't need more money. You don't need bigger houses. You don't need any of that. All you need is more of God. I wrote a song years ago called More of You, Less of Me. Some of you heard that song years ago when I sang it at Bethel. And I remember writing that song. I'm like, God, I have to decrease if you're going to increase in my life. In the message translation, I love how they express how confident David was with God's provision. Look what it says in Psalms 4, 6 through 7 in the message Why is everyone hungry for more? More, more, they say more, more. And he says this, I have God's more than enough, more joy in one ordinary day. One ordinary day, God fills me with his joy. 
David's confidence was not in man, but in God and God alone. He prayed, had confident hope in God, and he knew without a doubt he would be delivered. And in the end, that very last verse, God brought him something that you cannot buy, and it's peace. You see, because anxiety, if you've never dealt with it, don't make fun of it. It's a real deal. I, I'm, I'm telling you, man, I've, I've had those panic attacks in my life. I've had that enemy come against me and give me high, anxious thoughts. And let me tell you, it's debilitating. Some of you tonight are filled with anxious thoughts. You're worried about the future. And let me tell you something. There, is, there were some last words that Jesus spoke on the cross, and it was to two people. But you see, God, God's more than enough in all circumstances. Jesus is dying on the cross. He's dying because he died for you. He died for me. He's dying on the cross. And his mother Mary and John are at the scene. And Mary's distraught. Imagine moms watching your child die on a cross. And in this moment, Jesus loved his mother so much, he said this to her and he said this to John. John, behold Mary. Mary, behold John. And they embraced. But I guarantee you, Mary would have loved for Jesus to him. In his last time of dying, he was more than enough for his mother to provide her someone who would walk with her through the day and through life. That's the God we serve. He brings us peace. David's in the middle of the wilderness, cries out to God. God fills him with confidence and fills him with so much peace. He can sleep like he's never slept. How many wake up a couple night, times a night? And I'm not talking as you go to the bathroom. As you get older, that just happens. Let me just tell you, man. You get older, it just happens. Enjoy your young, your youth. Because How many wake up in the middle of the night and your mind won't shut off. There's a problem. That's a problem. And I'm not against taking medication or anything, but let me tell you something. That's the enemy working overtime to keep you in bondage. Galatians 5.1 says, I've come to set you free, now stay free. Christ died to set you free, now stay free. And we're not free many times. We're waking up in the middle of the night. We're restless. We can't sleep. So what do we do when we can't sleep or we can't get good rest? We go after things of the world to try to fulfill what only God can fill up. And so we add more stuff. Let me tell you, parents and kids are more stretched than they've ever been. In our town, I've never seen more traveling ball in my entire life. These people are constantly going, not against it. But I see the stress. I see the things in people's life and circumstances are becoming overwhelming. We lose sleep because of it. We just don't get rid of anxiety by chance. We must give it over to God every single day. And look at what Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. David was presenting his request to God and listen what happens when you do. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You'll be able to sleep. You'll be able to lay down at night knowing that you have had put your confident hope. You prayed. You have hope in Christ and he brings you peace. So many are tired, worn out, not living in peace at all in our world today. Maybe that's you tonight. I will say this with boldness. If you want to sleep well, pray. Get on your knees. Spend more time in the presence of God, not just on Sunday morning with three songs. How many like to sing in the shower so no one will hear you? Well, come on. Let it out, man. Get in the presence of Father, I need your presence because in your presence there's peace, there's joy, there's fullness. Verse 8, he said, in peace... I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, O oh Lord, will keep me safe. Wow. God will keep you safe. Brothers and sisters, my hope is that each of you will find peace that will allow you to rest, knowing that God will fight your battles for you. We sang it earlier about the battle song. I loved it. Great job, worship team. And when you trust him daily, you can stand with confidence that God will silence your enemies. Isaiah 54, 17, one of my favorite verses that I live by says this. But in the coming day, no weapon turned against you will succeed. 
I'm going to say it again. No weapon turned against you, formed against you, coming at you will succeed. It will not succeed. You will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. These benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. Their vindication will come from me. I, the Lord, have spoken. God's speaking to us tonight, right now, in this moment. And here's what God, I was telling Pastor David this afternoon, God's been speaking to me all week long, uh, not just from this service, but just to me personally. Like, have I really bent my knee and let go of some things that have been really holding on, I've been holding on to? If you're here tonight and you're holding on to whether it's bitterness or unforgiveness or anxiety or any of that stuff, I'm telling you tonight, my friends, I'm telling you, tonight's the night to let it go. There is, and this is not a pressure thing, but there is no guarantee you're going to wake up tomorrow. Why spend the last few hours of your day in the anxiety-filled way that you've been doing or the unforgiveness that you've been holding on to? Some of you need to get on your knees tonight and let it go. Some of you need to be real with yourself and quit hiding in isolation and get with a brother and sister tonight and said, I need you to pray with me. My life right now is overwhelming. You know how it is on Sunday mornings when you come in and you say, how are you doing today? I'm fine. And inside you may be dying. You see, I'm looking forward to a day when people come in through the doors and say, how am I doing? My life sucks right now. And, and, and finances are horrible. The doctor just told me that something is wrong with me. Man, when we start getting real, you're going to see real transformation. I've been in church all my life, and I'm done doing church, folks. I want to see a revival break loose in our communities, and it's only going to happen when the people of God will get real. And it starts with bending our knee and saying, God, here I am. Here I am. He's more than enough. Quit going to everything else and come to him tonight. Say, God, you're more than enough. You're more than enough to help those kids that have went away from God. See, I have a son who has not been in church since he was 18 years old. He's 30. But you know what? One day he'll come back. Maybe you're worried about that. Maybe your marriage is struggling tonight. Let me tell you, when you're married a long time, you begin to understand something that when you serve the other person unconditionally it is what Jesus wants us to do and tonight you have an opportunity to lay maybe your marriage and say God I've been wanting him to do something or I wanted her to do something when in all reality you need to come together and say God we want you to do something it's up to you I'm not I'm not a pressure preacher like come down so I can have a notch on my back we had 10 people at the altar but what I do know is that even in a crowd this size some of you are dealing with some stuff and man why would you leave without laying it down. That's the greatest thing about being a Christ follower. You lay it down at the foot of the cross. So I want to pray, and as I pray, if we have people who can help you pray, you know, man, if you want to come just for a few moments, i got a song I want to sing to you in a moment called Restored. And here's what I know. When you pray, when you have confident hope, and you get peace, God restores it all.